Our next step in discussing retail pricing is discussing the profit impact of the use of the break-even analysis. Uh, retailers often want to know the number of units they need to sell to begin making a profit. And so we look at the break-even analysis because there are a couple things we want to look at. Potentially break-even sales dollars to estimate the profit. Uh, maybe retailers are trying to justify introducing new products, or maybe they're looking for the sales they need to cover a price change. So what the break-even analysis does is that it determines, based on fixed and variable costs, how much merchandise needs to be sold to achieve zero dollars in profit. And then from there, you can use the analysis to um, calculate how much merchandise needs to be sold to achieve whatever profit you want to achieve in a retail setting. We look at the break-even quantity, um, which is the quantity at which revenue equals total cost. So we'll walk through this uh, just like we did with our markup and our markup percentage. Um, but the first thing, let's understand what fixed costs are and what variable costs are. So our fixed costs do not vary based on the number or the quantity of merchandise we produce. So whether we produce one t-shirt, a hundred t-shirts, or a million t-shirts, our fixed costs are going to be the same. And this would be the cost of the building, the cost of the equipment, um, and other fixed costs. Our variable costs based on the our based on the quantity of merchandise that we produced. So um, an example of this might be the labor hours that go into it. It might be the cost of keeping the lights on uh, in the in the production facility, depending on how many lights, how many merchandise items we produce. Um, for retailing class and for what we're gonna walk through in this chapter, these are always going to be given to us. Um, I'm sure if you've had your finance class, uh, you've, or you, you've walked through um, this process in a little bit more depth, um, but hopefully this rings a little bit of a bell for you. Uh, and the best way to talk about this is really to just do an example. So we're going to do an example and then we'll talk about um, what it means for the retailer. So let's look at PetSmart. And this example comes from your book. So we'll walk through this one together so that you have a reference point to go back and read about in your book. And then we're also going to walk through a second example after this. Um, but when we are looking at a break-even analysis for PetSmart, let's consider that they are introducing a new private label, dry dog food. And so PetSmart really wants to know um, how many how many bags of pet food they're going to have to sell in order to make a profit on this pet food? Because if they're not going to be able to sell that many bags, if they're not going to be able to make a profit, then they probably shouldn't introduce the new product. So PetSmart works with a manufacturer, and they know that the fixed cost is $700,000, and that's going to cover all the overhead and the equipment needed in the factory to get the manufacturing process going. They also know that their variable cost is $5 per bag of dog food, and that's going to cover the labor and the materials needed for each unit. Um, so that's going to cover the packaging, that's going to cover the sealing, that's going to cover the boxing it up, taping it up, shipping it out, etc. So our fixed costs are $700,000, and our variable cost is $5. Now, PetSmart generally doesn't charge more than $12 per bag of dog food of this size. So let's use that number for our retail price um, for this example, $12 per bag of dog food. So what, what, what PetSmart wants to know here is how many bags of dog food do we have to sell at this price in order to break even? Okay, so let's look at this. Here's the equation we're gonna use. Um, we look at break even quantity. What we do is we take our total fixed costs and we divide that by our unit sales price minus our unit variable costs. So again, what we're looking for is the quantity at which our revenue equals our total costs, so which our profit is zero dollars. So at what quantity will we break even? Well, what do we know based on the information we have? What are our fixed costs? We know that our fixed costs are $700,000. We know that we plan to sell the dog food for $12 a bag, and we know that our variable cost is $5 per bag. So this is what your equation should now look like. Okay, so what is our break-even quantity? You should have calculated 100,000 bags of dog food. 
So PetSmart knows that they need to sell 100,000 dogs of bag food, bags of dog food, in order to break even, in order to have their revenue equal their cost. Now, PetSmart would then go through and do an analysis of, okay, how many bags of dog food is that per store? How many bags of dog food is that per store per month? Um, and is it feasible or not? Now, my second question for you, and this is the second question that PetSmart is going to ask when they walk through this analysis. What is our profit for every bag of dog food sold over that $100,000 quantity? So what is the profit for every bag of dog food sold over that $100,000 quantity. In order to figure that out, all we have to do is take our unit, our, our unit sales price minus our unit variable cost. Because um, we don't need to consider the fixed cost because that is already covered in our break-even quantity. Um, at that point, our fixed cost is null and void. Right, so it becomes zero dollars. So we're just looking at our variable cost to produce each, each bag. And so that means our profit for every bag of dog food over the $100,000 quantity is seven dollars. So we're going to make seven dollars per every bag of dog food that we sell over 100,000. Now, assume PetSmart wants to achieve a profit of a $100,000. How many bags of dog food do they need to sell? So they don't want to just break even. They don't want zero dollars, right? At this point, we're looking at what we need to do to make a profit of $100,000 because let's say PetSmart says that we don't introduce a product unless we know for sure that we're gonna make $100,000 in the first year. Well, we just go back and we can change our initial equation up at the top. So we need to look at our break-even quantity. What is our break-even quantity um, in order to meet our profit goals? So let's go back and let's redo our equation. And let's look at our fixed costs. And let's go ahead and add in our profit. And let's take that over our unit sales price minus our unit variable cost. And this is kind of a a hint, a way to, to figure this out quickly. So our new break-even quantity is 114,286 bags of dog food. So now PetSmart knows that they need to sell 114,286 bags of dog food in order to make $100,000 in profit in the first year that this dry, food, dry dog food is in stores. So this tells us a lot of different information. This, this equation gives us a lot of different information. And from this pricing analysis, um, the, the retailer now knows how many bags of dog food they have to sell at this price in order to make their profit. Let's walk through a second example. Let's say that Walmart is considering introducing a new private label tortilla chip. Right, they're manufacturing um, costs for the chips uh, is, is $1 million. Their variable cost per bag is $1.25. And they know that they need to charge their customers $1.99 per bag of tortilla chips. That's the um, average price that they've calculated based on what their market percentage is. And they've looked at their competitor pricing. They've looked at uh, future sales price for the chips. And they know that they're going to set an initial price of $1.99. So what's our break-even quantity? How would you set this one up? What are our total fixed costs? A million dollars. What's our price? A dollar ninety-nine. And what's our variable cost? It's a dollar twenty-five. So your equation should look like this. Now, what is the break-even quantity that Walmart needs to sell? to make zero dollars in profit on this tortilla chip. You should have calculated 1,351,352 bags of chips. Um, I rounded up there. Um, generally, we'll round up to the nearest whole number when we're looking at our break-even quantity because you can't sell part of an item. So what is Walmart's profit for every bag of chips they sell over Oh, that should say over that 1,351,352 bags. 
Remember, to get the profit, we have to take our unit sales price minus our unit variable cost. So you should have gotten 74 cents. So Walmart is going to make a profit of 74 cents on every bag of tortilla chips they sell over that 1,351,352 number. Now, Walmart management says we don't introduce a new product unless we can achieve $2 million in profit in the first year. So how many bags of tortilla chips do they need to sell? What's our equation? Our top line should be our $1 million in fixed costs plus our $2 million in profit over our $1.99 selling price minus our $1.25 variable costs. So how many bags of tortilla chips does Walmart need to sell in order to break even? You should have gotten 4,054,054 bags of tortilla chips. Now that sounds like a lot of chips, right? Well, remember, we're, we're Walmart. And we have 3,407 super centers in the United States. Now, this bag of tortilla chips is only going to be introduced in our super centers, not any of our other types of locations. So what does that mean? Well, that means that each store only has to sell 1,190 bags of tortilla chips each year. And that means that each store only has to sell about 99 bags of chips each month. Is that reasonable for Walmart? Absolutely. So Walmart knows if they introduce this new private label tortilla chip, they can easily sell their 4 million bags of chips in the first year in order to make a $2 million profit. And that's how we use the break-even analysis to help us determine if we'll be able to introduce new products and make a profit. All right, moving on from break-even analysis, we're going to jump into our next topic. We're going to start talking about markdowns. Um, so in this section of the lecture, we're going to talk specifically about our clearance markdowns. Um, retailers mark down products for one of two reasons. Uh, the first is clearance, and that would be to get rid of slow-moving, obsolete merchandise, to dispose of it, get it out of the store. Um, and the second reason would be a promotional markdown, and that would be to generate sales of that merchandise. We're going to talk about in this section of the lecture those clearance markdowns, so how retailers start to get rid of slow-moving, obsolete merchandise from their stores. Um, so when merchandise is selling at a slower rate than planned uh, and will become obsolete at the end of the season, so we're talking about fashion merchandise mostly here, or seasonal merchandise, um, a retailer would clearance that out. If it's slow selling and we know it's going to become obsolete, obsolete soon, we need to get it out of our stores. They might also clearance their items if they realize that theirs is priced much higher than the competitors uh, because at that point, no one is going to buy from our retailer. They're always going to go to the competitors. Uh, so retailers will start to uh, mark that down because we know that slow selling merchandise can decrease our inventory turnover. And if our inventory turnover is very low, uh, it can prevent us from acquiring new merchandise. And it can also really diminish our image. Remember, if we're selling old styles and trends. Um, now, markdowns really are a cost of doing business, and so a retailer plans for them, um, and that's why we they set their prices. They talk about setting their prices um, really with a markdown in mind uh, because they still want to make a profit. So if we think back to how we calculated our retail price with our cost, and remember how we said that there are other things the retailer takes into consideration, and this would be one of them. The retailer understands that they are at some point going to have to mark merchandise down. And so when they set that initial price, uh, they'll often set it higher than what just the cost of the product would give so that they can afford those and still make a profit when they clearance their merchandise. All right, so what happens after the retailer puts the merchandise on clearance? Because the retailer has set their initial price, right? And that initial price is based on all the factors we've talked about. And so when they get to the point where they can't mark down the product anymore without losing money on the product, what do they do? 
Well, at that point, they liquidate the merchandise. So our clearance comes before we liquidate. Um, even with planning, right? Some merchandise just isn't going to move. Uh, so they have to, retailers have to consider other strategies to get the merchandise out of the store. And there's really six different methods they can consider. With the first being sell that merchandise to another retailer. So if the merchandise is not selling in your retail location and you've clearanced it down, um, maybe now you decide to take that merchandise and go to TJ Maxx or Marshalls or Home Goods um, or other stores, other retailers, and sell that merchandise to them. Now, generally, retailers only recoup about 10% of the cost of the merchandise here. Um, so they're still getting some money back. They're not losing all the money they spent on that product, but they're also, um, of course, selling that product to the other retailer at a price less than what they bought it from the vendor. So you're still losing a little bit of money, um, but you are able to recoup uh, generally around 10% of the cost. Uh, some large retailers try to consolidate their unsold merchandise. So if you're a large retail chain, this is an option to you. Um, if you are, for example, Target, and let's use the example of swimsuits, and you are going into the month of um, September, and you now have pieces of swimsuits, because we know women's swimsuits especially are sold by the piece, um, and they're often not sold in pairs, a lot of times you will end up with pieces of swimsuits at all of your locations across the country. Now, what do you do with those? It's September. You've already clearanced them out. They've gone from 30 to 50 to 75 percent off. Um, and we know that women's apparel is only marked up about 73 percent. So it's 75 percent. Um, Target's still taking a little bit of a loss on those. What do you do? Well, you can consolidate those. Maybe you gather all the swimsuits from the Northeast where it's September and fall is coming and it's getting colder and you take all those swimsuits and you send them to the target stores in Florida or California. And now all of those pieces are consolidated and you might be able to sell those better because from all your stores in the country, you might have more options available to customers who live in warmer climates who will still be buying swimsuits in September. Uh, you could also, um, Consolidate all your unsold merchandise to one of your own outlet stores. For example, Saks Fifth Avenue owns Off Fifth. Nordstrom owns Nordstrom Rack. And so you can consolidate your own merchandise to your own um, outlet store. Uh, now, this can get expensive because you do have to pay to transport that merchandise. Um, but it is definitely an option available. You can sell it at an internet auction. Uh, some retailers have their own site on eBay or Amazon. Um, where they sell merchandise that is uh, um, no longer selling in the store. And a lot of retailers use their own website for their clearance items. And they have a separate dedicated part of the site where you click on clearance um, and you can see what all items are available at an internet auction. Sometimes if you have enough clout, you can return your merchandise to your vendor. So if you remember, this is part of that negotiation piece um, we talked about with merchandise. Uh, some retailers are able to negotiate return of last season's merchandise that doesn't sell. You can donate your merchandise to charity. Uh, charitable giving by a company always looks good um, as a corporate practice. And the cost value is generally deductible from your income and reduces your tax liability. Uh, so that's a benefit to the retailer um, and also looks good from a charity perspective. And probably the last thing you'd want to do if you were a retailer, the last option would be to carry that merchandise into next season. A lot of times uh, retailers will carry um, some of their high priced non-fashion merchandise into next season. Uh, men's clothing carries over really well. Uh, furniture carries over really well um, because those items aren't necessarily becoming obsolete. Uh, if you're carried into next season. Uh, sometimes there's a profit loss from your inventory cost. Um, there's also a risk of merchandise getting shop worn or looking outdated. Um, but some retailers will just carry any unsold merchandise forward and try to sell it again in the next season. So those are some methods that retailers use to try to get slow moving merchandise out of the store um, to make room for new merchandise. And this is the first kind of category of markdowns that are taken on retail price. Um, in the next piece of the lecture, we'll talk about the second type of markdown, which is promotional markdowns, hoping to get customers into the store to shop.